As the world's population is set to approach almost 10 billion people by 2050, with more than 50% concentrated in urban cities, there is a growing need for advanced digital solutions. As the race to make cities smarter begins, the discussion has centered around certain buzzwords like cryptocurrency, the Internet of Things, and blockchain. But what do these technological advances really mean when it comes to the future of how we live? Will technology transform city life for the better or for the worse? Here to discuss how smart cities could disrupt the world as we know it is Robert Hal Turner, founder of Peritium, a provider of cloud communication services trusted by some of the world's largest telecommunications providers. Thank you for joining us, Hal. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. There's been a lot of excitement surrounding the smart city phenomenon, but with a lot of corporations trying to jump on the bandwagon, the parameters that define a smart city have become somewhat ambiguous. So before we dive too far into this topic, I'd like to create a working definition of what a smart city is in your opinion. Thank you. Smart cities are environments, um, villages, residences where the municipality has decided to connect things. Smart cities are environments that are put together for the benefit of managing the city, uh, city services like uh, water, electricity, gas, as well as providing overall connectivity for things like uh, messaging, for things like uh, accidents, uh, emergency situations, but also smart cities are there for the provision of secure services to all of their citizens because people go to shops, they go to restaurants, they go to, um, they go to buy coffee, they go to a bookstore. And smart cities recognize that the ability to bring all of this together with a payment system that is secure is a very, very smart thing to do. And by the way, smart cities are not just smart cities. Smart cities can be smart campuses. Smart cities can be smart businesses, smart corporate complexes, it can be smart anything. The key about being smart is having connectivity and having managed connectivity. And that's what we do at Peridium. Now that we have a working definition to build on, let's talk a little bit about blockchain, which is projected to be the backbone of smart cities. People have compared smart cities and blockchain to the invention of the PC. People took a while to understand the value of a word processor, which ultimately changed the world. And now experts are touting blockchain as a life-changing tool. But the average person has no idea what it is, even though they may be using it right now. What is the disruptive potential of blockchain technology and some potential applications? Blockchain is a very powerful technology because it brings security, it brings unbreakable trust to a transaction. A transaction can be a financial transaction, it can be uh, supply chain transactions. I recently saw an interesting YouTube video that described blockchain as a hamburger. And the whole idea was, when you look at all of the components of a hamburger, how do those components get there, and how do the quantities get measured, and how do people really understand that uh, I can trust that I'm going to have enough buns, I'm going to have enough uh, supplies and condiments to make my hamburger. So that is a, a very silly little example of what blockchain is, but most importantly, blockchain is the ability to record and have an unbreakable chain of information. So if I'm in a smart city and I am using blockchain, it means that I can program my, um, my appliances. I may be able to wash my dishes at a time when I get a better rate on my electricity or a better rate on my water. And I don't have to worry about, well, did I actually pay for what I have? Uh, blockchain secures that and gives me trust and confidence. So blockchain is a very powerful element. As it also applies to smart cities or smart locations, if you will, blockchain is an enabler that will allow people to create their own digital payment systems. A lot of people refer to that as cryptocurrency. But think about a city that for its residences is able to support through blockchain a payment form that's digital so that from your smartphone within the city 
You can pay for anything and you can get awards and recognition from that. Blockchain enables that. So it's secure. It is a way that uses encrypted data that is unbreakable and it is the most powerful thing for security that we've seen. And it is the capability of blockchain that will ultimately protect personal identifying information and really, in my mind, help alleviate some of the things that we're seeing in the news today about uh, too many people getting too much information on us and it being used for nefarious purposes. Critics of smart cities often cite privacy concerns as the downside. If we use Singapore as an example, which is ranked as one of the world's smartest cities, we can see that they've used the technology mostly for urban planning and crowd and crime management. In this real world example, it means increased surveillance, the installation of numerous sensors, facial recognition, and ultimately government monitoring. When so much predictive data is being gathered from people and devices, how much is data security and personal privacy a concern? And how can it be managed in a way that is palatable to a country's citizens? Singapore is an interesting example because it is a city state. And you have to imagine that the citizens of Singapore, by living there, are giving permission. They're giving permission to be observed and to be seen, and they're giving their permission to have this information gathered on them. I like to think about the privacy aspect when I think about a major Eastern European uh, city that we have been focused on. And this major European city views uh, the whole issue of privacy and security in the following way. Number one, they believe that their ability to get data that looks at patterns and data that looks at behavior is very, very important in bringing sponsored solutions and um, advertisement and awards to their citizens. The collection of personal information is at the choice of the city, if you will, and the citizen by giving their permission. Our networks and systems by definition only collect the metadata and do not transmit the personally identifying information. You have to give your permission for that to be gathered. So in that regard, it is a very, very secure system. Now that we've addressed this concern of Big Brother watching, there are a lot of benefits to converting a city in this way, sustainability being the most obvious. But why do you think countries like China are converting over 500 cities to a smart city infrastructure? And what are the benefits to the city and its citizens? It's a very good question. Number one, a city that is considered to be smart, whether it's the whole city or whether it's a street within the city, a smart city has the ability to monitor um, consumption of power, um, consumption of everything, and therefore to make sure that buying is done on an aggregated basis so it brings better pricing. Uh, smart cities are also able to uh, look at the efficiency in terms of how they receive water, electricity, efficiency in terms of how they receive their ability to access communications and the internet. That's the number one reason for doing it. And also to be part of what is the 21st and will be the 22nd century in terms of new services and features and availability. But I will tell you that probably Asia and China are not the best examples of why cities become smart. Cities become smart throughout the world because they recognize that as they're competing for business development and economic development and companies to move into their areas or to develop centers of excellence. It's only if they have a comprehensive set of services and communications that will attract as an affinity program uh, other companies to come in that uh, they will be successful. So smart cities become smart cities as a way to bring services to their citizens, to manage their own municipality in a more efficient way, and to attract new businesses and economic development, which increases the tax base, which makes everybody happy. There is one word that is unavoidable in this discussion, autonomy, from autonomous logistics hubs to autonomous vehicles. 
What changes need to be put in place to accommodate things like self-driving cars? Well, it's my view that nothing is really autonomous. And the reason for that is in the environment that we live and work in, everything would have to be totally connected and everything would have to be measured and monitored for there to be autonomy. You have variables. A variable could be a bicycle rider. A variable could be uh, a runner. A variable could be a child running into the road chasing a ball. So for there to be total autonomy, everything has to be fully 100% connected. In our view, we hear a lot of words like artificial intelligence. I think it's more like synthetic intelligence that creates um, autonomy if you are able to connect these things. And that's what a cloud of a smart city is able to do. So an autonomous driving vehicle has to be fully aware of everything that's both fixed and also moving or transversing the environment in which they are moving in. And we've talked a lot about flashier smart city technology, but surprisingly, this isn't just a developed world concept. In fact, since developing countries aren't encumbered by aging infrastructure, this is an opportunity to make a huge jump in technology. In what ways have you seen smart city technology utilized in non-industrialized nations? It's a very good question. So when you think about smart city technology, it's really just communicating applications and devices and taking the information. So we see in certain African countries, the highest percent of population in the world making purchases from smartphones. We see in other geographic domains, such as Brazil, we see the ability for uh, micro lending to occur, to run the kinds of uh, economies that are driven by small businesses on a daily basis. So to be a smart element, you don't necessarily have to be a full smart city, but all of these things can converge and create smart cities, which we think the municipalities of the world who really care about how their citizens are able to drive and park and pay for services as well as receive services from the city and get the efficiencies will ultimately be residences of smart cities but the individual technologies are driving change already. How do you think the U.S. administration's new infrastructure plan will impact investment into smart city technologies? I, I believe that the U.S. has lagged behind the rest of the world. And we observe in almost every geography of the world, including Asia, including Eastern Europe, Europe, uh, Northern Europe, we observe in Latin America, significant private-public partnerships that truly are investing in smart city infrastructure for the benefit of their citizens. The lag of the U.S., I believe, is driven by uh, regulatory policy that favors the large incumbent providers and really does not recognize the need that we have in many jurisdictions in the U.S. that's just as, as, as needy, if you will, as third world developing countries. And I believe that we have a real obligation to drive uh, regulatory change and a real obligation to make known where the needs really are and not have the infrastructure policy really tend to favor the agendas of large incumbent operators. Well, thank you again for joining us today, Hal. Well, you're quite welcome. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. As with all new technology, it will remain to be seen how life in a smart city will truly impact its residents. But most proponents will argue that smarter is always better.